Morning, my lady. I appear on behalf of the appellants, leading Mr. Raj Desai, sitting behind me, for the respondent, uh, Lord Folkes, QC, leading John Beggs, QC, and Aaron Rathmel. Um, can I just check that we've all got all the papers, uh, and also apologise for the mix-up in terms of the authorities bundle, which I think caused the court some inconvenience yesterday. I hope we're all there now. Yes, I think we are. Good. Um, I'll move then, without further ado, to introduce the case. This appeal concerns the death of Robin Goodenough. Uh, he died on the 27th of September 2003, uh, almost immediately after the infliction of force against him by the respondent's police officers. For practically all of the intervening 18 years, a period covering two criminal trials, judicial review and lengthy delays afflicting the civil litigation, the respondent has denied responsibility for his death on two grounds. First, it was said that the officers were acting in lawful self-defence, and second, it was said that the force used was in any case not causative of Mr Goodenough's death. The causation defence, which was critical in the acquittal of two of the police officers involved on charges of manslaughter, finally fell away during the course of the appellant's uh, claim for damages before Mr Justice Turner last year. During the course of the liability-only trial, the respondent's expert effectively conceded that the infliction of force against Mr Goodenough made a more than minimal contribution to the atrial fibrillation that caused his death. That left the defence of self-defence upon which the respondent succeeded. With that in mind, I propose, if I may, my lady, to give a very short factual introduction. I appreciate, of course, that my lady and my lords will have read the skeleton arguments and have read into the case, um, but uh, the appellants themselves are here, uh, and I appreciate this case is also being live-streamed, and it seems to me that in the circumstances it wouldn't be inappropriate to give a short factual introduction, but if I'm told otherwise, I, of course, will move on. I will move on. Thank you. On the 27th of September 2003, nine police officers were in a van being driven by PC Shane in the Oxford area. They saw Mr Goodenough driving an Astra motor vehicle at the Cowley Road roundabout. In the car was Mr Goodenough and two passengers. Officers within the van thought that the car and Mr Goodenough's behaviour was suspicious. PC Shane, the driver, turned on the blue lights. He turned on the siren to indicate that the Astra should stop. It did not stop. It exited the roundabout onto the Cowley Road, followed by the police van. The pursuit of the car was short, about 260 metres. Using radio, the timing of radio messages, we can compute that the average speed of the pursuit was 22 miles an hour. So over some 33 seconds. The car was being driven erratically by the finding of the judge. It came to an end when Mr Goodenough turned the Astra left into Alma Place, a narrow dead end with cars on both sides, and came to a halt near the end, the car at a slight angle. The police van stopped directly behind. The officers were concerned about the, in, the occupants of the car decamping. The officers poured out of the van to surround the Astra. In fact, nobody left the Astra. Police Sergeant Bates, the most senior officer at the scene, got to the car first and opened the door after a degree of tugging. I say the door, I mean the driver's door. He got pushed aside by other officers, including P.C. Shatford. P.C. Shatford leaned into the car to take the keys. The engine was on. P.C. Shatford said that he saw Mr. Goodenough turn to, start to turn towards his left. P. 
Missy Shatford claimed that he believed that Mr. Goodenough was going for a weapon, a needle, a knife, or a gun, according to his police notebook. He took Mr. Goodenough by the right arm and the right shoulder and pulled at him three times. Mr. Goodenough resisted being pulled by bracing himself in the car. Meanwhile, Police Constable Shane, the driver, got out of the van. He was uh, probably the last officer to leave the van. And he walked to the Astra. He claimed that he saw PC Shatford and another officer, PC Somerville, pulling frantically at Mr. Goodenough. He claimed that he detected increased urgency in their voices and formed the belief that Mr. Goodenough was about to drive the car into the officers. He accordingly formed the view that he needed to intervene by way of physical intervention. He punched Mr. Goodenough twice in the head. The first blow either missed or was a glancing blow. The second connected. Upon the second blow, according to the evidence of PC Shatford, he was the pulling officer. Mr. Goodenough went limp, or his resistance, his passive resistance, ceased. He was then pulled out of the car by PC Shatford with momentary assistance from PC Somerville. The circumstances and mechanics of that extraction are not properly explained in our submission in the judgment. We'll come on to that, especially by reference to ground uh, three. Mr. Goodenough landed on the street facing away from the Astra. He suffered significant injuries, a fractured alveolar ridge, which is a bone uh, in the mouth, loosened teeth, fractured teeth, substantial bloodying to his face. An ambulance was called. Two paramedics, Stephen Oakes and Teresa Hardy, arrived and they spoke to PC Shane before attending upon Mr. Goodenough. They swiftly recognised that Mr. Goodenough was in a serious condition. Indeed, he was not conscious and he was not breathing. They attempted to resuscitate him. He was moved into the ambulance. Attempts to resuscitate him continued, but Mr. Goodenough was declared dead within a few minutes of arrival at John Radcliffe Hospital shortly after one o'clock in the morning on the 27th of September, 2003. For the court's reference, I'm not proposing to take you to it. It may not be a document you've seen yet. The post-mortem report is in the core bundle at page 228. It's, of course, of course attached to the particulars of claim. I would take this opportunity to take the court to a few of the pictorial documents just to set the scene. Uh, You'll appreciate, of course, after his death, there was a, a large amount of pictorial and photographic evidence was produced to record the scene. I'm only going to take the court to a very small number of uh, photographs and, and a plan, if I might. Um, it looks as though everybody's working off an electronic version. Have I got that correct? Well, I'm not yet, but I will be within a few minutes. Uh, I've got paper bundles as well, which I actually okay. prefer. But very well. I do have the electronic bundles. C can we start, please, with, with page uh, 1843? It's volume C, my lord. Some members of the court may know Oxford better than others. Um, what we have at 1843 is a satellite type image of the plain roundabout, which is where the officers first saw the Astra. Cowley Road, along which the pursuit occurred, and the left turn into Alma Place. The court will be able to see that the route of the pursuit is in blue on the plan. As I think I mentioned uh, in opening, it's approximately 260 metres. 
Could we now turn, please, to two closer overhead photographs? The first of those is at page 1771. This is an overhead shot of Alma Place and Alma Place is the road which has a sort of dusty looking playing field or recreation area at the end of it on the left hand side of the page. If one traces one's eye along Alma Place one can see the Astra parked at a slight angle in the middle of the road. This, this is a photograph taken from the helicopter that was yep. sent up the next morning. Yes it was. Yeah. Do we know what time? Uh, no, I don't. I'll, I'll come back to my lord on that if I, if I can. But the, the Astra is the blue car, and it's in the same position as where we stopped. That's correct. It is, uh, and that's. We can get another shot of it in the next photograph, which is one seven seven eight. And there are lots of these photographs. They're all in the bundle. Um, many of them show the same thing, pretty much the same thing. If we turn to one seven seven eight, it's uh, the helicopter's obviously got a bit closer or somebody's used a zoom lens. You've got a better picture there of, of, of the Astra. And the reason I'm taking the court to this is one can see how close the Astra is from the end of the street. And the, the street, of course, is a dead end down the place. It's approximately five or so car lengths from the end of the street. And finally, if we could, sorry, I say finally, in this, in the section of the, in the helicopter section, can we just turn to 1780, please? This is a shot taken, another helicopter shot taken from the other side of the street, again showing the Astra. But what the court will see there is that there's an alleyway just ahead of and to the left of the Astra. The court may recall in the reading that when the officers cried decamp just before uh, they came out of the van after the after the Astra had stopped in some cases it was because they knew that there was an alleyway at the end of Alma Place and so it was a potential route for an es a, pot a potential escape from the for the uh, on the part of the occupants of the Astra although in fact Nobody, as I said, left the Astra at all. Could I now please go to street level photographs? These are rarely, these are rarely as good as one hopes, but we'll do our best. One seven nine nine, first of all, please. So these are also taken the following morning, but in uh, plainly they were taken before the helicopter shots because you can see that the police van is still behind the Astra. By the time the helicopter shots were taken, the van had been moved. You can see the open driver's door of the Astra. And you can get a sense as well of the closeness of the street, the narrowness of the road. Could we next please turn to 1803? This is a side-on shot of the Astra. Two points to note about this, please. First of all, the proximity of the police van to the Astra. It's maybe a foot, two feet maximum behind the Astra. Secondly, the driver's seat, position of the driver's seat, and this is in the context of the accepted case that Mr. Goodenough was bracing himself whilst he was being tugged, pulled by PC Shepherd.
And then finally, if we just turn over the page to 1804, 1 can see the blood stains, some of the blood stains on the road. It's not possible definitively to say where the landing point was, but one can see what we say that the principal blood loss, which we know from the post mortem report, came from the facial area, was approximately a body length away from the car, a body length away from the Astra. That's the whistle stop tour through the facts, and obviously I will go through those, the relevant ones, for the purposes of this appeal in a little more detail as we come to the particular grounds. Can I return to the trial? There were six key questions for Mr Justice Turner. One, did PC Shackford reasonably believe that Mr Goodenough was about to attack him with a weapon? Two, if so, was his use of force proportionate? Three, did PC Shane reasonably believe that Mr. Goodenough was about to drive into the officers? Four, if so, was his use of force proportionate? Five, was Robin Goodenough in fact about to attack PC Shackford with a weapon? Question six, was Mr. Goodenough in fact about to drive into the officers? After a two and a half day trial, Mr. Justice Turner answered the first four questions yes, and questions five and six were answered no. The effect of that was that the defence of self defence deployed by the respondent succeeded. The findings on questions five and six were relevant to the appellant's preserved case under so-called Ashley 3. It's our first ground of appeal in the Notice of Appeal. And I'll turn now to introduce our grounds of appeal. There are, as I say, four grounds. The first ground is that on the basis of the judge's findings that Mr Goodenough was in fact not about to attack Mr PC Shatford with a weapon and was in fact not about to drive at the officers, the, self, the defence of self-defence should fail. And we recognise that that argument is not, wasn't available to us at trial because of the uh, conclusions of uh, this court in Ashley and it is similarly uh, not open to us to argue in this court. But as the court will have seen, uh, Lady Justice Nicola Davis has given us permission to argue this in the Supreme Court if necessary on ground one. Well, we can return to the scope of what is and isn't available to you at a later stage. We didn't even address it now. Yeah. We, I, th I think it's common ground between the parties that we weren't proposing to argue the Ashley three point. Uh, um, and more practically, we hadn't prepared to argue the Ashley three point. No, we're but, not expecting you to. Thank you. And I'll come, I'll come back to, to, to that if necessary. Uh, uh, later on, but I'm uh, plainly it isn't, it's not an issue before the court uh, today. But it is worth noting in passing that the effect of the findings, it's paragraphs 56 and 61 of the judge's judgment, the effect of those findings is an acknowledgement, although it's not expressly stated by Mr Justice Turner, it's an acknowledgement that the officers were in fact mistaken as to the threat posed by Mr. Goodenough. Can I now turn to grounds two, three, and four? And I'll keep referring to them by that uh, nomenclature, if I might, that numbering, to avoid any uh, risk of confusion. Ground two is an attack on the judge's conclusions in relation to belief. That's to say the belief of PC Shatford and the, the belief of PC Shane. I anticipate 
but it is the ground of appeal that will take me the longest to develop orally. Ground three is an attack on the judge's approach to the question of proportionality. That's to say the reasonableness of the force used. Ground four is an attack on the overall fairness embodied within the judgment. It's a natural justice complaint. To a large extent, but not exclusively, it presents arguments raised under grounds two and three through the prism of natural justice. I don't expect ground four to take me very long from an oral perspective. But please don't think that for that reason it's in any sense a make-weight ground of appeal. I just don't want to waste time duplicating points that I would already have made. We recognise, as I hope is abundantly clear from the foregoing, that there is indeed an overlap between our grounds. Before I turn to ground two, can I just make a couple of preliminary points? The court will have seen from both parties' skeleton arguments that there has been a level of dispute about the standard of appellate review. I do not propose to detain this court with oral submissions in relation to that point. I will preserve those for reply if necessary. For current purposes, it suffices to say that our submission is that this case is governed by the observations of the Supreme Court in the Crown against Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police case. That's tab 17 of the bundle of authorities. I'm not proposing to turn it up. See in particular paragraph 64 per Lord Conway for giving the judgment of the court. And see also Sprint Room in this court at paragraph 76. We say that in this case, which involves evaluative judgments, there was a gap in logic, a lack of consistency, and a failure to take account of material factors, all of which are evident on the face of the judgment. These criticisms and more indicate that in this case, the Court of Appeal can safely conclude that the judge was wrong. This is not an appeal, which in our submission, that turns on fine distinctions as to the limits of an appellate court's review power. Well, that may or may not be right, but the, uh, uh, it's an issue that we have to consider when deciding whether or not the appeal succeeds. Yes, of, of course. Uh, I'm simply setting out our case as to what it is, but also to provide the court, I don't know whether this is a welcome reassurance or otherwise, that I don't propose, unless the court wishes to receive assistance on it, to go through the various authorities cited by both parties bearing on the question of the standard of appellate review. Um, they're in our written case. Um, I'm not proposing to develop the arguments orally. We have the bundle of authorities. If my, if, if my lady thinks it would be of assistance to go through those I will, of course, do so. No, I don't think it... I'm not inviting you to trawl through the authorities, but if there's going to be an issue between you and you anticipate their will, uh, I don't think it's satisfactory to leave an ex any extensive argument for reply. The... the um, as I go... I, I take the point. Let me state at the outset that our primary point in relation to both grounds two and three, this doesn't really matter in relation is that the judge's approach to reasonableness of belief and the judge's approach to the question of proportionality of force are both evaluative judgments. They are not attacks that we are making on findings of primary fact. And their skeleton argument. M my learned friends rely on the Henderson case in the Supreme Court to, su to submit that this is in reality just a dressed up attack on primary facts and this court should only intervene in cases where it's effectively a, 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 an attack made on the ground of perversity. There was no other conclusion reasonably open to the judge. 
we say that isn't the case. Questions of reasonableness, which are evaluations drawn from the primary facts, are necessarily evaluative judgments to which the observations of Lord Carnworth in the Manchester Chief Constable case plainly apply. We accept the questions of honesty of belief come much closer to findings of primary fact. But as I shall shortly show, there is a close connection in the context of self-defense between the two separate limbs of the belief test. That's to say the subjective and the objective limbs. The authorities show that the evidence which is relevant to reasonableness, to say the objective reasonableness of a belief in an imminent threat to safety, is relevant also to the honesty of that belief. In any event, so, sorry, sorry, forgive me. Are you attacking the judge's finding of the honesty of the belief? Of the I, I'm sorry, my lord. Are, I'm, are you attacking the judge's findings of the honesty of the belief of the officers? Yes, I, I am. I thought and you were. That does seem at first blush to be a finding of primary fact. Yes. What was in their mind? Yes, uh, we are. Um, uh, uh, but we are particularly doing so on the grounds of the approach taken by the judge to reaching that finding of fact. But uh, my lord's asked the question, yes, we are, uh, we are attacking that. Um, there's no point Don't you have to distinguish between his findings as to whether the officers did believe something, which is a question of primary facts, yes. not, not an evaluative assessment, yes. and the question as to whether that was a reasonable belief, which is an evaluative yes. assessment. And, and, and don't you, or do you accept on the authority is a slightly different approach of the appellate court to those two exercises? I'm saying, I'm just answering yes and yes to both of those questions. Yes, I accept that there's conceptual distinction between them, including for the purposes of appellate review. I accept that the finding, did X have a particular belief, is a finding of primary fact. In an ordinary case, that would be highly problematic for someone standing in my shoes. What what makes it different in this, in this case are two particular factors. One, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, there is a very close association between the subjective and the objective elements of the self-defense test. In other words, that which is relevant to the question of reasonableness is also likely to be relevant to the question of uh, whether or not the belief was actually held. So it, it, it Although conceptually, it's quite straightforward to distinguish between the subjective and the objective elements, in practice, there is an overlap in the evidential foundation of both. That was the first point. The second point is this. What I hope to demonstrate to the court is that the way that the judge approached the question of the honesty of the officer's belief was itself flawed. And in particular, it involved, but not exclusively, it, it, it involved a, an express failure to take account of material evidence slash argument. Thank you. Now, of, co of course, Some of the authorities relied on uh, by uh, my learned friends guard against appellate advocates taking uh, appeal courts through the evidence. And the phrase island hopping is one that recurs with some regularity. Uh, I make no apology in advance for having to engage in a degree of uh, taking you through the evidence. Whether it's called island hopping or otherwise, I'm afraid it's for the court to decide. I, I, we cannot put forward our case 
on appeal. In other words, demonstrate what's been missed by the judge without taking you to that evidence. Well, Mr Laddie, I can tell you that all members of the court have um, read substantially into the evidence. Uh, that's a... Which a, may shorten your task. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful indeed, uh, uh, my lady. Uh, if that's the case, then it will shorten my task considerably, I have to say. Um, uh, perhaps I can get, get some further indications from my lady as I, go, as I actually hit ground two and ground three, because I, obviously I don't want to test the court's patience in any way at all or take you to documents you've already seen. Well, speaking for myself, you gave us a reading list. Um, you both gave us reading lists, and, and I endeavoured to read what Thank I was you. asked to read. Thank you. Um, that's very, that's very helpful. I, I appreciate that this is that, that may have involved a greater amount of reading than is normal in a case of this kind. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I took in every word that I read. <laughs> I understood. Um, finally, by way of preliminary introduction, let me just say this: this is, of course, a case where, on the findings of the trial judge, which are not challenged by way of cross appeal. There was a death at the hands of state agents, police officers. We've made this point in writing, and I will restate it orally. As Sir Brian Leveson said in the E7 case, see tab 10 of the authorities, paragraph 1, page 226 of the bundle of authorities, the use of fatal force by police officers rightly requires the most detailed and rigorous examination. It is our case that did not occur here. I shall now move to ground two, errors in the evaluation of the required belief. I propose to start here with the law and ask what is the law in relation to self-defence and civil litigation? For the time being, pending the possibility of this case going to the Supreme Court, the position is governed by the decision of the Court of Appeal upheld by the, Supreme, uh, by, the House, uh, by the House of Lords in Ashley and the Chief Constable of Sussex. The facts of that case were that uh, there was a firearms operation uh, carried out in Brighton. During the course of that fi firearms operation, on a flat which was believed to be uh, the home of a potentially armed criminal, James Ashley an unarmed man who was in bed at the time the police entered was shot by a police officer. The claim for damages brought by his family was struck out at first instance. That was a claim brought in assault and battery and was appealed successfully to the Court of Appeal. Could I ask the court please to turn up the authorities bundle at tab 7. And please, within, uh, within that, page 127, paragraph 37 of the judgment of the Master of the Rolls, summarising the three different possibilities that arise in terms of the level of belief in a case of self-defence in civil proceeding. One, identifies the three possibilities as follows. One, the necessity to take action in response to an attack or imminent attack must be judged on the assumption that the facts were as the defendant believed them to be, whether or not he was mistaken, and if he made a mistake of fact, whether or not it was a reasonable mistake to make. Two, the necessity to take action in response to an attack or imminent attack must be judged on the facts as the defendant believed him to be, whether or not he was mistaken. But if he made a mistake of fact, he will only establish the relevant necessity if the mistake was a reasonable mistake to make. Three, in order to establish the relevant necessity, the defendant must establish that there was in fact an imminent and real risk of attack. These are Ashley 1, 2 and 3. If we move forward, please, within the bundle to paragraph 78. I'm not proposing to go through the uh, detailed analysis of the, of the law. 
but rather to take the court to the master of the roll's conclusion at paragraph 78, page 137. Three lines down at paragraph 78. My conclusion is thus that a defendant has a defence of self-defence to a claim for damages for assault and battery if he shows, first, that he mistakenly but reasonably thought it was necessary to defend himself against attack or an imminent risk of attack, and second, that the force he used was reasonable. In this line, which I emphasise, this solution seems to me to hold the balance fairly in the civil law between the legitimate interests of the claimant on the one hand and the defendant on the other. Now, I shouldn't leave uh, uh, the master of the roles judgment without also uh, looking at paragraph 79 and 80. Paragraph 79, in considering whether the mistake made was reasonable, the court must, of course, have all of the circumstances of the case in mind. On the one hand, depending upon the circumstances, it might well be reasonable for a defendant to think that he was being or about to be attacked. On the other hand, as Lord Lane, Chief Justice, observed in the Williams case, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the defendant's belief is or may be relevant to the question whether he in fact held that belief, which feeds into the answer I gave to my Lord, Lord Justice Nugie a little earlier on. Paragraph 80, something of repetition here, Further, if it is held that the defendant genuinely reasonably thought that he was being or about to be attacked, the court must again take all the circumstances into account in judging the reasonableness of the action taken by the defendant. There's then a citation from the judgment of Mr Justice Elias, as he then was in the Beachy case, which includes a reference to the, at the uh, if one turns over the page, to the, to the uh, indented extract, reference to a soldier often having to act intuitively and that in assessing his conduct and judging the action of the reasonable soldier it is important to recognize that his action is not undertaken in the calm analytical atmosphere of the courtroom after counsel with the benefit of hindsight have expounded at length the reasons for and against the kind of degree of force that was used by the accused but in the brief second or two which the accused had to decide whether to shoot or not. Uh, Mr Justice Elias said that those observations applied in the context of liability and civil law, and Sir Anthony Clarke, as one can see from the final line of paragraph 80, agrees that those are relevant considerations. Could I also take the court, please, to the judgment of Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, in this case, is paragraph 192, page 164. I'd like to take the court to two passages from Lady Justice Arden's speech. Uh, in, can I ask the court, I'm not going to read it out, can I ask the court to read paragraph 192, please? Appreciate that it's sidelined. is a robust explanation of why Ashley 2 importing the requirement of reasonableness was preferred to the uh, submissions on behalf of the Chief Constable to the effect that even an unreasonable mistaken belief would found the defence of self-defence in civil proceedings. I said that there were two paragraphs in Lady Justice Arden's uh, uh, judgment, which I would take you to. The second is at paragraph 208. And this deals with the heat of the moment point. Between uh, letters D and E, second half of paragraph 208. If I could take it up, please. However... I would not in advance of all of the facts being found wish to be taken to suggest that once that dilemma is shown, the dilemma of an officer facing uh, the potential uh, threat, 
it is relevant to the exclusion of other factors. So Anthony Clark, uh, Master Rolls, has used the, the phrase heat of the moment to describe this dilemma. I understand this, that phrase to mean that the stage has been reached in which there is a risk that if action was not instantly taken, the threat that was reasonably and honestly believed to exist, or which did in fact exist, would translate into action leading to serious injury. Heat of the moment is, however, one of the relevant factors. The importance of that, we say, is that uh, whilst, of course, recognising the heat of the moment does have to be taken into account, it doesn't operate in an exclusionary way. Chief Constable appealed to the House of Lords. Much of the judgment of the House of Lords, which is at uh, tab 8, is taken up with a consideration of whether it was an abusive process for the claim to be brought in circumstances where uh, certain aspects of the claim have been admitted. And they're not relevant for our purposes. I'm only proposing to take the court to the judgment, the speech of uh, Lord Scott at 18, page 182, if I might. As I said, the judgment of the Court of Appeal was upheld. Forgive me, I should have added, I appreciate that the court will have picked this up already from the reading. In the Court of Appeal, counsel for the Ashley family contended for solution three. That argument was rejected, although certain noises were made in the Court of Appeal about recognising the force of it, but the argument wasn't pursued on a cross-appeal basis in the House of Lords to the explicit regret of some, but not all, members of the House. The point was expressly declared to still be open. Indeed, it's on that basis that we understand that permission has been granted by uh, Lady Justice Nicola Davis. But returning to what the state of the law is at the moment, we could turn, please, to page 182 uh, in the bundle of authorities and, and take up uh, the speech of Lord Scott at paragraph 18. Having at paragraph 17 explained the function of the defence of self-defence in the context of the criminal law, he then turns to explain that the function of the civil law is different. And I could, if I could take it up at, at, at letter H, towards the bottom of the page. As to assault and battery in self-defence, every person has the right in principle not to be subjected to physical harm by the intentional actions of another person. But every person has the right also to protect himself by using reasonable force to repel an attack or to prevent an imminent attack. The rules and principles defining what does constitute legitimate self-defence must strike the balance between these conflicting rights. There's then a reference uh, to the criminal, the balance in the criminal law, which I needn't read out. He then returns at B to the civil law. To hold in a civil case that a mistaken and unreasonably held belief by the appellant, by A, that he was about to be attacked by B, justified a preemptive attack in believed self defense by A on B, would, in my opinion, constitute a wholly unacceptable striking of the balance. It is one thing to say that if A's mistaken belief was honestly held, he should not be punished by the criminal law, it would be quite another to say that A's unreasonably held mistaken belief would be sufficient to justify the law in setting aside B's right not to be subjected to physical violence by A. I would have no hesitation whatever in holding that for civil law purposes an excuse of self-defence based on non-existent facts that are honestly but unreasonably believed to exist must fail. This is the conclusion to which the Court of Appeal came. So, can I just draw the strands of this authority or the two decisions together and just identify the following principles that we say apply? One, the defence of self-defence in civil litigation requires a belief that the alleged tortfeasor was under attack or a real risk of imminent attack. Two, the element of belief is divided in two. There is a subjective element and an objective element. It has to be re objectively reasonable. Three, 
the objective element, as the judgments to which I've just showed, referred the court show, is crucial for the balancing of rights. And from the point of view of the victim, it's the right of the victim not to be subjected to the infliction of physical force. Four, the analysis of what is reasonable, that is to say the objective element, may also be relevant as to whether the belief was actually held. The use of force itself must be reasonable or proportionate. And finally, at both stages, at the belief stage and at the use of force stage, all of the circumstances must be taken into account, including the fact that this may be something which occurs in the heat of the moment, but that does not operate as an exclusionary factor. You're not departing from the way in which you put your case in your skeleton argument, paragraph 16. And what the president, present state of the law requires. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Malin, will you ask me if I was departing from it? Yes, I'm asking you whether you were departing in any way. No. The purpose of my submissions just a moment ago was partly in response to the way that the respondents have put their case in their skeleton argument. You'll, you'll appreciate there was a sequential, uh, a, a se sequential service of skeleton arguments, uh, and I wanted to deal in particular with the, the principles underpinning the test that emerged from the Ashley decision in this court and uh, the House of Lords, and also the, the proper role of the heat of the moment point. C can I now turn to, to the judgment? And on the ground two, bearing in mind my lady's warning about the court having read in this case in detail already, I'll just indicate well, I don't think in advance. It's a warning. I think it was just to give you information. It was guidance, perhaps, and, and I, I do intend to follow it. But what I was going to say was that my submissions in relation to the ground two are going to fall into three parts. First, some general submissions about the judgment from the perspective of, of, the, of the judge's approach to belief. Second, to focus on the judge's approach to PC Shatford's belief. And third, the judge's approach to PC Shea. So the general points, first of all. We say that the part of the judgment dealing with the claim of battery is jumbled up we would have expected the judge to deal with each use of force and to ask the questions relevant to the issue of self-defense in a logical and sequential order. There are three critical uses of force here. First of all, Shatford pulling at Mr. Goodenough, then P.C. Shane's punches, and then P.C. Shatford's extraction. Let me say, by the way, that I recognise that the first and third of those are linked. There's a continuum between them. I'm not seeking an artificial division of analysis on the part of the judge. But in fact, when one reads the section of the judgment dealing with the issue of battery, and even recognising that there are some contextual factors that overlap, that apply to all uses of force, the order in which the judge has approached the issue of self-defense is elusive. In other words, it is not clear that there is any order. By way of example, in some cases, the analysis is clearly back to front. Just by way of example, paragraph 55 sets out the judge's findings vis -vis, uh, on, in relation to the proportionality of force. Paragraph 57 
contains a discussion of the reasonableness of P.C. Shane's belief. They're back to front. Indeed, you can't even analyse what is properly proportionate by way of the use of force until you know what the belief is. Second preliminary point. Let me just deal with the point that is uh, uh, made in my learned friend's skeleton argument, a paragraph 41. Mere citation by the judge of the correct test for self-defence which we acknowledge he does, is insufficient by itself to satisfy this court that the correct test has in fact been applied correctly, that will only emerge from looking at the judge's reasons in the round, in particular whether or not he has performed the necessary analysis. And this is perhaps the most fundamental of the preliminary points or the overall points. We say that there is no proper analysis of the nature and extent of the risk posed by Mr. Goodenough from either a subjective or an objective standpoint. And in support of that proposition or that contention, we make the following point. First, nowhere in the judgment is there any reference at all to the fact that Mr. Goodenough never used or threatened to use any violence against any of the officers. We contend that that is an extraordinary omission, especially in circumstances where the claimed beliefs relied upon by the respondent were not common or guarded types of uh, fears of violence on the part of Mr. Goodenough, but a claimed belief in quite extreme levels of violence. In the case of Mr. PC Shatford, use of a weapon, needle, knife or gun. And in the case of PC Shane, driving a car at the officers. Second, there is no reference anywhere in the judgment to the sheer implausibility, both in hindsight and at the time, of Mr. Goodenough threatening any violence to the officers in circumstances where there had been a short chase, he had come to a voluntary stop, he had not tried to escape, and he was completely surrounded and outnumbered. Third, insofar as the judge has dealt with the nature of the risk. It is, we say, highly significant to look at what he has said. Paragraph 48, that's page 165 of the core bundle, reads as follows. It is important not to analyse the events which occurred in Alma Place in isolation. We've got no problem with that. The officers were entitled to take into account the circumstances leading up to this point. Mr. Goodenough had already shown himself capable of taking a criminal risk, criminal risk in deciding to make off rather than to stop when it was obvious that he was being required to do so. This is a consideration which was bound reasonably to colour the officers' beliefs <coughs> as to the potentially dangerous steps which he might further take to avoid <coughs> detention. There is no recognition there that the criminal risk involved in, a, in driving off, not immediately responding to the police sirens and flashing blue lights to pull over. I accept that is criminal conduct, the offence of failing to stop. But it is of an entirely different 
order to the possibility of using violence against officers. There is no relationship between the two. We say that this is a good example of an unexplained gap in logic. There is an even more compelling example of this in the next paragraph. The officers were also entitled to include that if Mr Goodenough had really decided that the game was up after he'd come to a halt in Alma Place, then he would have turned off the car engine and complied without delay with the officers' calls for him to get out of the vehicle. Then this. I find that his failure to do, to do either was reasonably interpreted to amount to a serious and imminent threat to their safety. And we say that this is also illogical and amounts to applying the wrong test. Essentially, that is saying that somebody who doesn't immediately cooperate with the police is at risk of having his lack of cooperation regarded as being a serious and imminent threat to their safety. With respect to Mr Justice Turner, we just do not see how that is logically sustainable. There is no explanation of what serious and imminent risk being referred to, or why it was a reasonable interpretation. In my learned friend's skeleton argument at paragraph 42, they refer, in answer to this criticism in our written case, to a couple of instances from the transcript. I don't know if the courts had the opportunity of reading the transcripts of the, uh, uh, of the evidence below. I can't recall now whether it was on the, uh, on the reading list. But they re refer to a couple of instances where there are exchanges between Mr Justice Turner and me about the, 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 uh, the correct approach to the question of risk. They've given a couple of page references. See paragraph 42 of their skeleton argument. It is striking that my learned friends have had to resort to mining the transcript for references to the judge engaging with the question of the nature and the level of the risk, rather than pointing to passages within the judgment where the question of the nature and level of the risk is analysed on its face. Whatever occurred in terms of counsel slash judge exchanges during the course of cross-examination, those exchanges did not make their way into the judge's analysis, at least on the face of the judgment. Those are our arguments in relation to the overall position and the judge's overall approach to the belief. Can I now turn to the second uh, aspect of our case, which is his approach to Shatford's belief, PC Shatford. Again, we reiterate, uh, there were two separate uses of force, initial laying of hands, then the extraction from the vehicle. It's important to make this point P.C. Shatford's justification for both was the same. In other words, he thought that uh, Mr. Goodenough was going for a weapon. And for your reference, his notebook is at uh, page 640 of the uh, supplemental bundle, which is a few pages into volume B for those working from the paper version. Now, this was addressed by the judge at paragraph 54 of the judgment. And if uh, my lady and my lord to be good enough to turn up paragraph 54 the claimants peremptorily dismissed the suggestion that PC Shatford believed that Mr Goodenough was reaching for a weapon when the latter turned towards the inside of the car I do not share their scepticism it may have been folly for Mr. Goodenough to attempt to avoid arrest in this way, but these were not circumstances in which it could safely be assumed that a suspect would behave in a rational and measured fashion. Now, the, any argument 
between the parties as to the correct approach to appellate review is of no relevance in our submission in relation to this passage. That is an error of principle by the judge. He has failed to ask the correct question. Did PC Shatford reasonably believe that Mr Goodenough was reaching for a weapon with which to attack him? Instead of which, he has applied a different and incorrect test of whether or not the officer could safely assume that Mr Goodenough would behave in a rational and measured fashion. It isn't the same test, it's not even close. And we say that's an, a clear error of law. Next, as we see from a little bit further on in the same paragraph, the judge derided, I'm sorry to say, our attempt to engage with the reasonableness and, for that matter, the likelihood of Shatford having the claimed belief. So in accordance with the guidance that emerges from the Ashley case, we relied on this effectively overlapping evidence in support of our case on the subjective and the objective limbs of the self-defence test. This is what the judge says. The claimants rely on a catalogue, which it would be disproportionate to rehearse here, of no fewer than eight points of challenge to PC Shatford's explanation. But this approach falls once more into the trap of relying too much on retrospective and leisurely forensic analysis than a realistic appraisal of his state of mind over a matter of seconds. The uh, closing submissions are written closing submissions, which are, are to be found in the supplemental bundle, uh, this, the, 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 the passage that he's referring to at uh, pages uh, 82 uh, onwards at paragraph 38. The, uh, what one can see from the judge's treatment of the points that we raised, and on the basis that the court has read our closing, or the relevant paragraphs of our closing written submissions, I'm not proposing to take the court to them. The judge is effectively refusing to take them into, the, into account by elevating heat of the moment into an exclusionary principle. He's not refusing to take them into account, is he? He's just um, uh, rejecting them. Well, if he's rejecting them, he's doing so on a peremptory basis by saying that they've been dreamt up at leisure and he's not engaging with them properly. It may be helpful then to have a look at what those, what those. Um, that's because that's the reason he gives, my lady, for refusing to, for not dealing with them, for dismissing them. Right. They are all he, points he, he says. Undoubtedly dismisses them, but um, uh, he, he and, but he has them in mind when he reaches the conclusion that he does, but he doesn't accept them. Well, the reasons that, he gives. That in my submission is a, a very generous reading. The, the points. That's what he says. Well, he, he says that they they've all, all of the points raised fall into the trap of relying too much on retrospective and leisurely forensic analysis than a realistic appraisal of his state the of mind. He gives for rejecting them. But that doesn't that doesn't have the effect of engaging with the arguments that we've raised, and has in practice the effect of elevating heat of the moment to a trump card. This is, a, 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 in my submission, a, an important point that arises, not just on this case, but in many police cases. It is in the nature of police work that, they co that, that confrontations will be, will be regular. Do you want us to take us to the points? I think you've referred to them, so we might as well have a look at Of course. Them. So uh, it's paragraph 38 of our closing written submissions. Yes. Uh, starts at page 82. It's 
So the these are the this is the so-called catalogue of eight points. Yes. First of those is the Chesterman point. So I'm calling it Chesterman point on the basis that the court understands what I'm saying that it's that it's a point that Shane, that PC Shatford would have raised at the briefing with PC, with uh, uh, Detective Superintendent Chesterman at three o'clock in the morning. He didn't do so. I'm not going to. The, the, the points are at paragraph 38, uh, my lady. I'm 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 not going to insult the intelligence of the court just by reading them all out. They are points which we say the judge ought to have engaged with, more than simply saying that they are dreamt up at leisure by counsel with the benefit of, uh, of, of time on his hands. And, and I should add, of course, that these are, are, are points which operate cumulatively, both on the subjective and the objective uh, limbs. Some points are recognised as stronger than others. But especially in the context of a effectively a death in custody case, they ought to have been addressed in detail, at least some of them. My lady, I was on the point of saying that this is an important point in the context of this appeal, with potentially wider ramifications. Police officers, for obvious reasons, often find themselves in situations of confrontation. Neither as a matter of tradition nor as a matter of law is it the position that police officers are encouraged to hit first and ask questions later? Or to put it differently, the law doesn't expect police officers to operate on a worst case scenario. Any time that a police officer gets involved in a confrontation with somebody else, or a member of the public, there's always the possibility of there being a concealed weapon or some terrible doomsday outcome. But it isn't reasonable for an officer to jump to the conclusion that that is what he or she has to protect themselves against. Because to do so would be to strip the requirement of reasonableness, jealously guarded, see Ashley in this court and in the House of Lords, of any substantive content. And when the judge in this case dismissed the arguments that we raised, for example, at paragraph 38 of our closing written submissions, and also around there, he wasn't engaging with our arguments about reasonableness. Because it isn't enough, we say, to say of an officer, well, it happened quickly, it was late at night, it was dark. There were only a few seconds in which to decide what was going on. That's a get out of jail free card for police officers in all kinds of situations and capable of being abused. Even allowing for the fact that decisions have to be made in the heat of the moment, one still shouldn't be working from the, from the starting point that a police officer is acting reasonably if he operates on a worst case scenario. Ignoring the objective evidence which indicates that there is in fact no threat to him. Fearing that something may happen is not the same as having a reasonable belief that it is about to happen.
we say that the effect of this, in particular paragraph 54, but I invite the court to look at the totality of the judgment, is that Mr Justice Turner just hasn't engaged with especially the objective limb of the reasonableness test. I've already pointed out the first half of paragraph 54, he has applied the wrong test. And our contention is, as one can see from the second half of paragraph 54, he has effectively refused to engage with our arguments challenging reasonableness. And for that matter, credibility too. <coughs> we would say... You've read what, what uh, we've got in uh, paragraph 38. If this court is with us, the judge has erred in principle. We recognise that this court is at something of a disadvantage in relation to the subjective question of P.C. Shatford's belief, but is actually in as good a position as the trial judge to all intents and purposes for the purposes of the objective belief. He didn't have a weapon. The only real basis which PC Shatford relied on for the suggestion that Mr Goodenough was going for a weapon was that he turned to his left in the car, there being no other indication of the use of violence. That, we say, can never provide a proper objective basis to satisfy the defence of self-defence. We can't make general findings about what are fact-specific issues as they arise in every case. Uh, the, the, the court is, this court, uh, is entitled to draw inferences from the facts found. Not, not, not least in, in but, but uh, I think you were, or maybe you weren't, inviting us to provide some sort of general uh, view about what can and can't amount to uh, a proper case in these circumstances. What I'm saying to you is that it's clear that it has to be a fact-specific uh, determination uh, in each case. I, of course, agree with that. Uh, the invitation I was giving was, uh, uh, if I was giving one at all, was, was, was really to guard against the possibility of heat-of-the-moment type arguments having a, a, a trumping effect uh, in cases of this kind. We say that that is the error, or one of the errors into which this judge fell. One of the consequences, we say, of dismissing the appeal on this ground, if that's what the court was minded to do, would be effectively to provide encouragement to, uh, to defendants, to police officers, to not have to justify the reasonableness of their actions. These cases tend to arise in circumstances where the use of force by police officers is preemptive. Plainly, there isn't going to be a dispute where the police officer is, in fact, already under attack. So they concern the use of preemptive force. It is critical, we say, that the use of preemptive force is properly justified. There will be times when it is justified. We recognise that police officers work in difficult situations, in pressurised environments. They do a valuable job. None of that is a licence to strike people without there being a proper basis. And so we say that the fact that decisions have to be taken quickly should not operate in practice to displace 
the requirement of reasonableness which is so jealously guarded. But of course, all of that arises, I, I, I accept, in the context of fact-specific cases. What we say is particularly striking is that, in this case, is that there is so little evidence to support P.C. Shatford's view in relation to a weapon. P.C. Shatford could say on the basis of a man turning left, getting to turn left inside the car, I thought he was going for a gun, needle, or knife. Then uh, police officers in future will be able to say whatever they like on the basis of the scantiest of movements, the flimsiest of uh, evidential foundations as to some uh, doomsday scenario that they were concerned with. I think I'm going to accuse you of island hopping or inviting us to island hop because when one reads the judge's judgment, it's not just someone in a car moves to a left. It, it's after a sequence of events. He says you have to, to look at it in context, and the events include some erratic driving down the Kelly Road, uh, turning into Armour Place where there was evidence that pedestrians had to jump out of the way, a general atmosphere that the, the situation was a tense one, the police officers asked him to get, told him to get out of the car. He didn't. He resisted opening the door. All that feeds into the judge's assessment of whether P.C. Shepford actually believed the movement to the left indicated a, a threat. And so you can't just take the movement by itself as being all that is in the. the Creates the belief. I, I accept that, and I, 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 I will apologise if, if it appears that, that I am island hopping. I'm really not. I, I'm, I did start my analysis of this section by looking at paragraphs 47 and 48, where the judge does say you have to look at the whole context. We accept that has to be done. But the point that we're making is, even if one looks at the whole context, and it includes a, a period of, at its worst, it's criminal behaviour by Mr. Goodenough in the sense that he's not stopping and, and uh, well, you, you heard what we've had to say about the speed of the car, except that the judge finds that he drives erratically. It's not the same as a threat of violence. Just because somebody acts in a criminal way, of course, doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's excluded from the analysis, but it doesn't provide support for it by itself, or really to any significant degree when taken in conjunction with something else or a conclusion, a belief, that the individual is about to behave in a violent manner. That's the crucial point here. You have to stand back and say, where's the evidence, in this case, of Mr. Goodenough offering force to the officers? I, I, I take the point, he'd acted in a criminal fashion, but he'd also stopped. He'd stopped the car voluntarily. It was a short chase. He didn't try and escape. He was surrounded. Yes, my, my point was, it's very difficult for us, even reading the transcript, to recreate the atmosphere of the trial when the, over two to three days, all the evidence is available to a trial judge in a way that simply can't be to us. Um, and, and when one reads the transcript, one gets some of the feel for the trial, but one does not get the same feel as being immersed in the entire sea of evidence. Um, and, and on this question, whether whether P.C. Shatford actually believed it, it is a question of primary fact, and, and it's, it's not just a question of evaluation of the objective material. For yeah, us. As, well, I'm, I'm uh, not going as to you've accepted. I, I, I've accepted that in principle, with the, with, the, with, the, with the caveats that I mentioned. Of course, you say this question. I mean, this question has two parts. It is the ob subjective and the objective, and I appreciate. In this court, my task is harder in relation to the former than it is in relation to the latter. I have to, I have to accept that. Um, but um, uh, on the question of the uh, relative advantage and disadvantage, disadvantage of this court vis-a-vis -vis the trial judge, uh, of course, I, I'm not going to pretend that we can fully recreate the experience of the trial in this court. That's that, uh, and I'm not going to pretend that the transcript provides a perfect substitute either. But this is a case where the trial occurred 
some uh, 17 years after the index incident. And, and if my lord has read the transcript, one will see that there were a lot of exchanges which were perhaps not terribly productive in the sense that the, the officers just didn't remember. They, they couldn't remember. They were going back to their evidence that they'd given on previous occasions, be it the police notebook or the, or the criminal trial. In some instances, you'll have seen that the judge, in some, in some places, there was implicit criticism, I felt, by the judge of the claimant's approach to the case. And that they didn't, for example, call the paramedics to give, with, with, I appreciate I'm going off at a slight tangent. With respect, it would have been pointless to do so because th there was no realistic prospect of them remembering the details of conversations they had 17 or 18 years. It's not a, a, it's not a primary foundation of our appeal, of course. So in the context of this case, we say, whilst it's not a perfect substitute, unusually, especially in the context of it being a police case, fact heavy, of course, this court is, in fact, in a pretty good position. Of course, it's not entirely uh, dependent upon the documentation, but we say that it is in a good position, a sufficiently good position, we would say, in summary to stand back and ask itself, what is the evidence that could support a finding of reasonableness of belief? Taking into account that all of the circumstances, including heat of the moment, but also taking into account, as the judge appears not to have done, the fact that Mr. Goodenough did not offer any violence but in all the points. What you have to do is, is um, persuade us that there, is, uh, there are errors Title us to go down that path as a first step. Well, in I, other words, errors in the judge's approach well, the, the, and the, his analysis. Forgive me, my lady. Well, um, I, I'm I'm not going to duplicate the submissions that no, I you, and um, and that turns on the point you made in relation to paragraph 54, 55, and 57. Uh, yeah, in relation to I mean, all the points I make uh, feed into the overall. Uh, outcome that we seek in this case. We say this, it's not just a, a single error. The, the judge has failed to take into account a number of matters. He's elevated heat of the moment to a trump card. We can see from the first half of paragraph 54, he simply asked the wrong question. This is only in the context of P.C. Shutford, by the way. Paragraph 54, he's asked the wrong question as to whether or not it, it could safely be assumed that he would behave in a rational and measured fashion, rather than actually asking the question, did he reasonably believe that he was going for a weapon? That we say, I, I, I wasn't sure that that sentence is directed to reasonableness at all, because what he's addressing is the submission that PC Shatford did not believe Mr. Goodenough was reaching for a weapon, which is the fact of belief, not the reasonableness. When he says, I do not share their scepticism, I read that as saying, I, I don't accept their criticism of the suggestion that P.C. Shatford actually believed he was reaching for a weapon. I, I, I agree. I, 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 if anything, I was erring in, in favour of the judge by treating that as also being a reference to the reasonableness. But if, if, if my Lord's observation is right, then one will search in vain anywhere else in this judgment see where the, where the trial judge tests or analyzes the reasonableness of PC Shatford's belief. That's as close as we get to it. In short, I, we say on the question of reasonableness of belief, if I focus on the objective element, there was n little or no evidence to support the reasonableness of the assumed belief and an abundance of evidence to contradict it. Can I now turn, I'm conscious of the time, uh, to Shane's, PC Shane's belief. This is the third and final element, although 
there'll be, I suspect, an air of familiarity about the things I'm going to say in relation to the judge's approach to shame. Remembering, of course, that PC Shane, his justification for um, inflicting force upon Mr. Goodenough is quite different to Mr. Shatford's. Uh, his justification was that he believed that Mr. Goodenough was about to drive the car into the surrounding officers. And for the court's note, please see uh, PC Shane's notebook. That's at 1168 of the supplemental bundle, volume B. So, of course, so it's not a point that we've really drawn out to date. It was, of course, for the respondent to prove that PC Shane had that belief and to justify its reasonableness. Here, we pay closer attention in this court to the subjective aspect of it, to the question of whether, in fact, PC Jane, PC Shane, rather, held the relevant belief. Our first point is that the judge failed to analyse with sufficient care the appellant's case about the evolution of PC Shane's account. I have to accept that it's not as if the judge didn't address it at all. In our closing submissions, especially at paragraph 47, please see page uh, 87 of the supplemental bundle, We set out a series of criticisms of PC Shane's account, both from a subjective and objective analysis. We, we, we apply, broadly speaking, the same approach uh, to subjective and objective vis-a-vis -vis both officers, recognising, as I indicated earlier, that although they're conceptually distinct concepts, the evidence relevant to one is also relevant to the other. We set out a paragraph 47 of our closing submission, closing written submissions, uh, a number of arguments. These are arguments at paragraph 47 which relate to the evolution of the Shane account. And I don't know to what extent the courts had the opportunity to go through uh, the evidence in relation to this. But I would ask, I, I'm in a position to take the court through this myself now to show the evolution. I, I'm conscious, I don't, I, obviously I don't want well, to invite. You've set out, in, I mean I'm looking now at your pages uh, 87, 88, I mean the, the critical parts of the evidence are identified, aren't they, in that, those paragraphs yeah. of your closing submissions? Yeah. Can I, can I try and deal with them from a from a uh, from a head from a sort of headline yes. point of point of view, if I may? Yes. Because as I as I've acknowledged, I have to acknowledge. I don't want to take a bad point. Some of these are dealt with to an extent by the judge. Point one. This is this is. Uh, forgive me for being um, approaching this in such a, a laborious way. Point one is, in the context of evolution. When the paramedics turned up, are cases that PC Shane did not tell them that he had punched Mr. Goodenough. That's the first point. Of course, at that stage, nobody realised there was anything seriously wrong at the time that the paramedics turned up. The paramedics turned up, they were called, because there was blood appearing on Mr. Uh, Goodenough's face. He was still breathing, he was making noises at that point. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, the evidence before the, before the trial judge. And PC Shane was the first officer who spoke to the paramedics. The paramedics gave their, um, made witness statements on the 28th of September, the day after the events in question. 
Both refer to having met PC Shane. Both say that Shane told the paramedics that, he, that Mr. Goodenough had facial injuries. Mr. Oakes said that Shane had told him that Mr. Goodenough had facial injuries caused by falling out of the car. And importantly, there was this. Both Miss Hardy and Miss, uh, sorry, Miss Hardy's account in particular was corroborated by the fact that in the ambulance, that's to say the ambulance taking Mr. Goodenough to the hospital, she was accompanied by PC Somerville who hopped in. She asked him whether or not Mr. Goodenough had been punched in the face. This is all in the, to deal with the question of whether or not Mr. Goodenough, uh, sorry, Mr. Sh uh, PC Shane had told the paramedics that he'd punched the officer, in, the Mr. Goodenough in the face. Essentially, the paramedics said he had not. Mr. Shane said that he had. Um, can I draw attention to the fact that at paragraph 58, it's quite late on in the analysis of the judgment. The judge does conclude. He says, I believe Mr. Shane, PC Shane, in relation to the what he told the paramedics. It's the first half of paragraph 58. The claimant suggested PC Shane had deliberately tried to hide the fact that he'd struck Mr. Goodenough twice because there's no record in the notes of the paramedics who were not called to give all evidence. Just pausing there, it wasn't notes. They were witness statements produced to the police the following day. But the P that PC Shane told them about this when they arrived on the scene, and it wasn't appreciated just how serious Mr. Goodenough's condition was. PC Shane, however, insisted that he had told them about the blows, and they must simply have omitted to make a note of this. I believe him on this point. Can I ask that the court turn? I'm, I'm sorry to ask to but hop before, around within before the scene. We, yes, before we get too far down into the detail of yeah. this, and obviously we've had a look at it, what conclusion do you invite? First of all, did you invite the judge to draw from that? And secondly, what conclusion do you invite us to draw from that? I.e. that on your case as it was presented below, PC Shane had uh, not told the paramedics what he spoke about as is common ground a few hours later. Yeah, uh, it, it, taken in isolation. I don't, I'm not expecting this court to, to draw any inference from that fact taken in isolation. The point that we make, the, the reason why I'm developing this point, and if it, I, I, I appreciate it's difficult because I, we have to descend into the detail, and I, 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 I'm, I appreciate that offers difficulties for my case, is to support our overall submission under this particular head that the judge failed to approach the question of belief vis a vis PC Shane appropriately, failed actually to test both the subjective and the objective elements of the self-defense test vis-a-vis -vis PC Shane. At this stage, the arguments that I'm advancing come under the rubric of failure to deal with the evolution of Shane's case. I sense that, that um, there's a danger for me in terms of going descending too much into the detail. And I, 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 yes, I, I think it's important not to lose sight of the, the, the point you make for the purposes of this appeal. Yes. Because uh, the issue was ventilated below and the judge came to a conclusion that he wasn't persuaded that your case on evolution led him to the conclusion that PC Shane had not been frank about this. Yeah. And that this was had implications for the genuineness of his belief. Yeah, I think. I, I, can I can I take? I, I, I bear that in mind, and I, I'm, I will do my utmost to, to not lose sight of the bigger picture here and recognise the limitations of what I have to work with. Of course, mm. could I, however, take the course, if I might, to page one six one six. The 
top of the page. This is just an extract from the transcript for the job. And having sounded the note of caution that I did earlier on about, about the, the, the limitations of any cross-examination in the context of a case which, is, which took place so long after the index events, can I, can I just ask you to, to, to read the uh, first question and its answer? Whether through oversight or some other reason you didn't tell them that he'd received punches to the face. I, at the time of the trial, I was sure I told them, but I don't remember that conversation now. You've got two paramedics there who've got no reason to lie. I can't explain it, I'm afraid. I'm, I, I'm not sure it's right, the judge, as the judge said, that PC Shane insisted that he had told them about the blows. And it's uh, perhaps a more fruitful line of inquiry is in relation to the Chesterman briefing. And you'll have seen that the appellants placed a great deal of weight on this. We should make it clear that we only received the, appellant, the, the notes of the Chesterman briefing a week before trial. Which page do you want to look at? Well, can I, I'll take you to the, have you, I don't know whether the courts had the opportunity to see the Chesterman briefing. Um, the account given to uh, Detective Superintendent Chesterman is found at 1751. Forgive me, it actually starts at page 1750. You'll see that this is a transcript of D.R. Chesterman, sorry, Detective Superintendent Chesterman's uh, notebook. Uh, he was working in the professional standards department of Thames Valley Police at the time. At 1.45, you'll see he receives a telephone call from D.I. Pet Petford with an initial account. By this stage, Mr. Goodenough is dead. And you'll see six or seven lines down that already by that stage, an officer has stated that he punched good enough to the face. At three o'clock, there is a briefing. You'll see for that from the lower half of the page. I draw attention to the fact that amongst the officers present were PC Taylor and Superintendent uh, Graham. P.C. Taylor was the Police Federation representative. There is then an initial account provided by P.S. Bates. You can see that from the top of the, uh, sorry, about a third of the way down the next page. P.S. Bates took the lead in outlining events to me. court will have picked up, of course, that P.S. Bates, uh, who was the first officer at the vehicle, was pushed out of the way and then claims to have had no recollection of what occurred subsequently until Mr. he turned around and he found Mr. Goodenough on the floor. And so the relevance of that is? In the context of this, purposes. in the context of this, it means that whatever P.S. Bates was relaying to uh, DI, Detective Superintendent Chesterman must have been provided to him by other officers. So he's relaying an account provided to others. To, by others. Halfway down it says Goodenough was uncooperative and P.S. Bates began to pull him out of the driver's seat. About halfway down the page we see P.C. Rob Shane stated that when Goodenough was still in the driver's seat of the Astra he had punched him twice in the face. These blows connected with his cheek and not his mouth. There were, there were this may be a transcription error, it might should be these probably, were distraction blows as he was uncooperative and difficult to remove from the car.
So it was common ground, first, that at that briefing, no officer spoke of any fear that Mr. Goodenough was either about to attack an officer with a weapon or was about to drive at officers or for that matter was about to use any other kind of force whatsoever. Second, one can see that a positive reason was given for the use of force, and this is recorded as having come from the lips of PC Shane himself. I appreciate I can't, this doesn't apply to PC Shatford. He was uncooperative and difficult to remove from the car. They, they, these were distraction blows as he was uncooperative and difficult to remove from the car. Let me just stop there, or pause there and observe. That is not, one, the justification relied upon by PC Shane at trial, and two, is not in law a justification for the use of force. Because being uncooperative, and difficult to remove from a car, is not the same thing as creating a risk of uh, threat to one's safety. We have to look at the way the judge deals with this. See paragraph 50 to 52. It, it is with respect not clear what the judge is finding from uh, paragraphs 50 to 52. Starting with paragraph 50, it says, the note doesn't purport to record that the reason given for the use of force was only that Mr. Goodenough was being uncooperative. But no other reason is given. And with respect, I don't, that is an example of a gap in logic. The judge goes on to explain it, explain this conclusion. If this is what Superintendent Chesterman had actually understood to have been the case, then it might be expected that he would have recorded immediate serious concerns about the use of this degree of force, but no such concerns are expressed. But that fails to acknowledge the role of Detective, Superin Chester Detective Superintendent Chesterman. And to this end, I wonder if the court could please turn up, please, 1718. Foot of one. This is an, uh, a witness statement that Chesterman wrote on the 3rd of October, a few days later. The foot of 1718, two lines up, he said, my role therefore was as the initial investigating officer. At 3 a.m. I attended the conference room to address the officers involved and gain a deeper understanding of the incident to inform my initial investigation. That's precisely what he was doing. I explained my role to the officers present, present and the fact that, in my opinion, an independent force was likely to be brought in. He then set out what he established, and it's effectively uh, it's a repetition, a slight fleshing out in his witness statement of what occurred at the briefing. And just for the avoidance of doubt, if one turns to page 1720, one can see in this statement, top paragraph, six lines down, PC Rob Shane then stated that whilst good enough was refusing to get out of the Vauxhall Astra, he'd punched him twice to the face. PC Shane stated that these two blows connected with his cheek did not connect with his mouth. They were intended as distraction blows as good enough was being uncooperative.
So the judge has, with respect, misunderstood what Detective Superintendent Chesterman's role was. It wasn't his role to record concerns. It was his role to investigate on an initial, on an initial basis. But that was his role. Not to evaluate, but to investigate. The same point may be made in relation to paragraph 51. This is what the judge holds at paragraph 51. A similar point is made concerning the note of what PC Shane said about his distraction blows with respect to Mr. Goodenough as he was being uncooperative and difficult to remove from the car. Again, this is factually correct and does not justify the conclusion that PC Shane wasn't fearful for his own safety or that of the other officers at the relevant time. What well, I appreciate it, of itself it doesn't justify that conclusion, but what is happening at the briefing is that Superintendent Chesterman is taking an initial account of what happened and has recorded PC Shane's own words as to why he struck Mr. Goodenough. And it is important to note this, that at trial, PC Shane did not suggest that the notes were inaccurate. I thought he said he had, the, he had no recollection of saying those words, and all he said was that I hit him. He, he didn't say that they, were in, that, he, that they were inaccurate. He said he had no recollection, but he accepted that, that he personally had no recollection, and he didn't contest or suggest that they were wrong. In fact, I think he even suggested it might be he, he, that some, his recollection was that somebody else might have said it. It wasn't suggested there had been some, uh, that essentially it was fabri a fabrication by, uh, PC Chester, by Superintendent Chesterman. That's the point I'm making. It, the, the paragraph 51 is where the judge says, well, the notes weren't expressed to be verbatim. But we know, I'm not going to repeat the point but, uh, uh, ad nauseam, the judge was that the, the officer, the senior officer, was carrying out an initial investigation. It was significant uh, what he was trying to do. And we know that he had the opportunity on two subsequent occasions to flesh out or correct any errors in the initial notebook. They occur in the notes of the gold meeting, which occurred the next morning, 10 o'clock. The court has the reference to those in our written submissions. And then, of course, again in the witness statement that he produced on the 3rd of October. And in fact, not there's a, the, the, those written accounts are entirely consistent. I'm sorry to bring you, bring you back to, to the point, but, but we are dealing here with an appeal Against, we're not called upon to make findings along the lines that the only possible conclusion in the light no. of um, your case on the emerging account was X or Y. We've got to determine whether or not the judge fell into error. So if you could just assist on what your key point is on this. Because the judge, as you've already acknowledged, he does deal with your argument, although you don't accept the conclusion that he reaches as a result. It, it, it's I, I'm dealing with it in this context. I, I've almost reached my end of, at the end of my submissions on this particular point, the evolution point. Well, if I can give you that that assurance, um, the, the, as a matter of logic, this crops up under this arises underground too, because we're saying that the judge's analysis of the Chesterman note was seriously flawed. That's of relevance to ground two, of course, but it's also of relevance to ground four. And the ultimate conclusion here reached by the judge is we say unsustainable, which is at paragraph 50, uh, 52. He says, again, I'm satisfied the primary aim at that stage was to establish a coherent understanding of what had happened on the ground and not a detailed analysis of the state of mind of each of the officers concerned. Well, those are that's a self-contradictory proposition. A coherent understanding of what happened on the ground involves at least some analysis of the state of mind of each of the officers concerned. In any event, we've got the record of the state of mind. But the judge is delimiting the significance of this. 
in a way that we say is entirely unconvincing and contains within it gaps of logic. That, that's the is question. He's correct in recording, is he, that the fears were recorded <sighs> shortly afterwards the, on the following evening? And that, that is factually correct, what the judge says at the end of paragraph 51. It, it's, it, it depends what you mean by shortly. The briefing is at 3 o'clock in the morning on the 27th. After that, the officers are released, they go home, they're allowed to go home, and they came back the same evening to do their notes. In fact, I think Shane started, I may be wrong about this, I'll be corrected if, if I am. Most of the officers started their notes at 7 o'clock the following evening, following evening, but I think that PC Shane may have started his even later. But it certainly wasn't before 7 o'clock the following evening. When I say the following evening, I mean the evening of the 27th. Let's put it this way, it's at least 16 hours after the, the 3 o'clock in the morning briefing. But we, on, this, on this side of the court, we wouldn't accept that that's, we wouldn't ex agree with the characterization that that's shortly after, but be that as it may. So th that was our position. I'm not, I don't want to say anything else about evolution. Can I now turn, evolution, of course, I accept, goes uh, absolutely to the subjectiveness, the subjective quality of the uh, self-defense uh, aspect of this litigation. Can I now turn to objective reasonableness? This is the question of whether or not PC Shane reasonably believed that he was, that Mr. Goodenough was about to drive the car into him, into, sorry, into other officers. Can I, this is an evaluative decision, we say. And the judge's approach to it really is found at paragraph 57. PC Shane had a limited view of what was going on around the driver's seat of the Astra, but he could tell from the shouts of his colleagues there was a sense of growing panic and a developing struggle in the effort to get Mr. Goodenough out of the car. In these circumstances, it was reasonable for him to deploy force in defence of his fellow officers. There's then a reference to uh, Williams and McRae, I'll come back to that. And that is it we say, in terms of the judge's analysis of the objective element of PC Shane's claimed belief. So let's assume that my arguments in relation to the evolution of the account fall on stony ground, and this court takes the view that it would be inappropriate to interfere with a purely primary, a finding, a finding a pure primary fact still have to deal with the question of reasonableness. And that is where we have the judge's analysis and conclusion. And what's striking about this, point one, is, is the similarity with how he's approached the same issue in relation to PC Shatford. That's to say, there isn't a point in the judgment where the judge says, was it reasonable for PC Shane to believe that Mr. Goodenough was going to drive the car at the other officers. That question is absent. But that is the question which the judge was required to ask under Ashley. Even if it's right that there was a sense of growing panic, or that he thought there was a sense of growing panic, even if it's right that he thought there was a developing struggle, that's not the same thing as thinking that, or being reasonable to conclude, believe, that Mr. Goodenough was going to drive into the other offices. And I want to make this point in relation to driving. Everyone in this court will have come across instances reported in the media 
of officers having been killed in the line of duty, including by people running them over. I cannot, and I didn't before the, before the judge at the trial, say that that's a possibility that could be excluded from any situation where an officer approaches somebody in a car, whether the engine's on or off, for that matter. But it is an entirely speculative possibility in almost every case. In other words, the risk of it happening is negligible in almost every case. Why do you say that? Because statistically, it is so improbable. And I would go further than that in, in, in this case. Uh, and was there evidence of that? I mean, are you, what are you basing this upon? Well, it, 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 it's not for us, of course. The, we don't have the burden of proof in this case. It's not no, as but you, you've made, you've made a, you, you, what you've said. I'm asking you what the basis for that is. Well, I, I, of course, I, we didn't call expert evidence or indeed any, put any statistical evidence before the court or, um, as to the amount of occasions on which this, on which this occurs. Of course, I've, I've acknowledged fairly that it does, I hope fairly, that incidents of officers being driven at do occur. But uh, I would hope that it's not contentious, that it is extremely rare. But, but I would say something else as well. In this case, Mr. Goodenough had already come to a stop, and I showed you the photographs. He's in a dead end, five or so car lengths from the end of the street. So. I anticipate that my lady will say, well, what do I base this on when I say in the, in the, on the occasions when, when officers do get injured by cars driving up, by people driving cars at them, it's in the context of people trying to escape. Yes, but I'm not sure how, I mean, what, what the, the judge's task is to look at what happened, come back to the point I made earlier, it's a fact-specific analysis. Sure. On, on the facts at the time and whether or not incident A or incident B is happens on frequently or not frequently, um, do you say that's relevant to how the judge should approach the question of objective reasonableness? Well, I, I do because that, it, it forms part of the context of something that's known as the inherent probabilities. I, I, I don't shy away from that from that proposition. It is inherently improbable that somebody who has come to a stop in a dead end, who is surround, who has not get, who's not got out of the vehicle, but hasn't tried, and thus hasn't tried to escape, who is surrounded by police officers, it is inherently improbable that that person will then engage in what could only be described as a murderous spree by driving the car. Well, I'm not sure that's right. Um... It's, it's absolutely not uncommon for people trying to escape from the police to drive in a way which exposes them to a risk of danger. That doesn't mean that all those drivers have a murderous intent. No, I agree it with that. It means they're trying to get away from the police, and the police in their, their duty are trying to stop them. For, for, forgive me, my lord, that was precisely the distinction I was trying to draw. Yes. Um, I agree that in, 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 the, in, in the occasions when people drive at or at the police, they are typically... I know, know from my lord's background that, 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 that it's something that he would have encountered before. It's typically in the context of them trying to escape. That's what distinguishes this case. He couldn't have escaped because he was in a dead end. That's why I use the phrase murderous spree. For him to have driven at the police officers could only have been... I appreciate murderous is also a kind of worst case scenario, but, but it could only have been in a, with a view to injuring or potentially killing officers, but not with a view to escaping. That's the, that's the difference here. And that's far more improbable. And there was certainly no evidence in this case that a man who admittedly hadn't stopped his car when, when initially told to, and hadn't got out of his car when initially told to, there was no evidence that he would jump from that kind of behaviour to behaviour of an entirely different order. Um, we, just as we had done in relation to PC Shatford, we produced a list of 
point which undermined both credibility and cogency, in other words, which went to subjective and objective. Those are in the closing submissions at page 91 of the supplemental bundle, see paragraph 49. Again, those aren't specifically addressed by the judge. That is a supplemental point. Our primary point is the judge just hasn't asked or answered the correct question. That is an error of principle which of itself undermines the safety of his conclusion. Of itself renders, we submit, this judgment wrong. Can I deal briefly with the citation of Williams and McRae at paragraph 57? We accept, of course, the principle that in some circumstances it would be appropriate for Officer A to rely on what he intuited from Officer B and C's movements or perceived actions and to respond to that. Williams and McRae, as I, the court I hope will have recognised, is a, a case which neither party has been able to obtain the transcript from. It's just a, an, an extract from Clayton and Tomlinson's civil actions against the police. Uh, no reason to doubt the accuracy of my colleague Mr Tomlinson's citation of Williams and McRae in, 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 his, in his book. But um, it does appear to be an, arrest, an old arrest case. Since then, the law has moved on in terms of arrest. See, for example, O'Hara uh, and Chief Constable of the RUC, See also Parker, and Chief Constable of Essex, cited by my learned friends. I'm not going to take the court to the to the authorities in terms of the level of uh, in terms of focusing upon what is known by the individual arresting officer. The, diff the difference between Williams and McRae on the face of it in this and our case is that PC Shane isn't stumbling upon a scene where two officers are chasing somebody else. He's already at the scene. He's seen the chase. He's seen the car stop. He has seen nothing to suggest that Mr. Goodenough will suddenly mutate from being an uncooperative, erratic driver to somebody willing to use his car as a weapon against officers. I make the same point by way of summary vis-a-vis PC Shane, as I did in relation to PC Shepherd. Not only is this a case where the judge has made an error of principle by simply failing to ask and answer the right question, he has reached the bald conclusion that he has in circumstances where there was no evidence to support the suggestion that Mr. Goodenough was going to drive the car at the officers and an abundance of evidence to contradict it. And whilst, of course, that's a contention, which I made before the trial judge and I make again now, which is made necessarily with the benefit of hindsight, that is always how we test reasonableness. There was nothing special about this case that allowed the, the, the officers, sorry, I say the officers, I mean PC Shane, that allowed PC Shane to jump to the extreme conclusion that he did. It was contrary to the inherent probabilities. The judge hasn't dealt with it properly, either by way of principle or by way of uh, looking at the evidence. For those reasons, we say that the appeal should be allowed on ground two. If the court is with us in relation to that, that is to say it agrees that the conclusion of the trial judge on ground two has been reached on a demonstrably inadequate basis. The evidence in this case is before the court to a sufficient extent to allow this court to substitute a different conclusion 
to the one reached by the trial judge. I accept that is harder to do in relation to the subjective element of the test, but it's certainly available in relation to the objective element of the test, and that that option is available in respect of both PC Shapford and PC Shane. Well, lady, I propose now to turn to ground three, yeah. errors in evaluation of proportionality. Starting point, if the respondent has discharged the burden of demonstrating that force could be used, the respondent needs also to demonstrate that the force used was proportionate in all of the circumstances. Reminder of the force used, we've got the initial attempts to pull Mr. Good enough from the vehicle, PC Shatford, PC Shane's punches, and then the extraction. We are not focusing for the purposes of this appeal on the first of those, because it wasn't suggested that the pulling was legally causative of death. Was it suggested the punches were legally causative of death? It's found that the punches were. The punches were. Yep. Or you say found, was there a it, it, concession? Yeah. Uh, and what were the terms of the concession? Do we find? I'm not that? sure that the concession was reduced to writing. The way that it, the way that it was, uh, uh, the way that it was put, uh, as I, I'll be corrected if, if I'm wrong in relation to this. I'm doing this from, from memory. My Lord. In opening, we made it clear that we that our contention was that the punches and the extraction were legally causative of death. You'll appreciate doesn't really appear in the judgment that both, party, both parties called medical experts. In but, but there's a mechanism which, which underlies that, which relates to the issue of, of the um, state of the um, Mr. Goodenough's health, if I can put it like that. Is, is that not correct? I'm not sure. Well, well, we're not dealing with a case where there was a blow to a head, for example, manslaughter type case, where there's a blow to, to the head which causes brain damage, which leads to death. And you say it was causative of death in the context of uh, the issue we're considering. Precisely what was the mechanism? Um, well, I, I, as, 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 as found. You'd appreciate that medical experts were called on both sides. Yes. After the the respondent's medical expert completed his evidence. It was conceded, yes. as I recall, by Mr. Beggs, Queen's Counsel, that the defence of ca the causation defence was no longer being relied upon mm. by the respondent. And in other words, they were no longer suggesting that the force used was ca was not causative of death. And to be fair, as I recall it, our case did not involve an allegation that the initial tugging was causative of death, mm -hmm. but it was the punches and the extraction from the vehicle that were causative of death. And it's important to note, you don't have these in the bundles, I'm sure we can produce them if you like. Both experts in producing their reports focused on the role of those two elements of the violence, that's to say, the punches and the extraction from the vehicle, and giving their respective views as to whether or not it was causative of, of death. I'm not sure, my lady, if that answers your question. But, but I, what I'm trying to do is help the court in terms of the, of the well, I think, what was, uh, what was asked, the terms of the concession. This was a, a brief trial. I, as I said, I'd be correct if I'm wrong. I don't recall that being, re being reduced to writing. It was a, as I, I hope is clear from a trial that took place so quickly, it was done in a, a good spirit and, and, and in a cooperative manner. Would the judge record paragraph 26 of his judgment is that after the medical evidence, it had become clear that the defendant's stance on causation was not sustainable and the defence was rightly abandoned. But I don't think I had picked up from that that it was abandoned both in relation to the punches and in relation to the extraction. But if that is the position, I mean, no, no, we made clear if it wasn't the position, if that is the position, then if you succeed on either of those, then you succeed on proof Correct, causation. that's right. The, the underlying issues are addressed in paragraph 15, not necessary to 
to um, as as to causation. Yeah, it's a it's a this this cause, cause being of, cause the, of deprived of the atrial fibrillation caused by the stress of events. <sighs> Yes, my, my lady said this isn't a manslaughter type case, my, but of course it will be recalled that in fact manslaughter charges were brought against PCs Shane and Shatford. And indeed, there, there was... Um, well, we're dealing with the situation as it was by the time it came to the judge. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, but I, I'm not sure I recognise the distinction that my lady was trying to draw, because I, I, forgive me, I may have misheard. We would say this was a manslaughter type case, albeit we're, we're dealing with it in the, in the context of civil proceedings rather than criminal proceedings. As it happens, manslaughter charges were brought. But um, of course, events had moved on. Difficulties with the medical case had been resolved, which, which plagued the prosecution of the original case, criminal case. Uh, had been simplified, perhaps I can use that neutral expression, by the time we came to the civil trial. So there were experts called on both sides, <laughs> both, of course, objected to cross-examination in the usual way. The outcome of that, as one can see from the judgment, is that the causation defence was abandoned. M M Mr Beggs is, of course, in court. If I've, m if I've misunderstood or misrepresented in any way my understanding the terms of that concession, I invite him to get to his feet now and clarify it, but, but I, I, I really don't recall there being any disagreement or doubt in the light of the, of the expert's conclusion, the expert's evidence, forgive me. It was, it, was, it was in relation to both elements of the force used. Could I just ask a question about, about facts, really, which might be associated with... I, I, I'm, I'm terribly yeah. sorry, my lord. I'm deaf in my right ear and I'm struggling Right, to I'll, s I'll speak up. Um, could I just ask a question about the facts? a little, which might arise out of the same uh, basic point. Uh, you've been dividing, for reasons I understand, the pulling and the punching and the extraction into separate events. It's actually what appears to have happened, is that the officers are trying to pull him out. The Mr. Goodenough is resisting that, not by fighting, but just by trying to stop it happening by whatever. Shane then punches him, which perhaps causes him to stop resisting, meaning that the existing pulling suddenly extracts him. Uh, so it's all part of actually the same sequence of events. Is that really uh, how it was? I, I certainly accept it's a, it's a sequence of uh, events. Uh, I don't, in fact, disagree with the overall characterization, um, which is why we recognise, although the initial pulling, if you like, justified on the basis of the weapon we say was unjustified we recognize that it ends up in, in in the extraction as to the mechanics because if this is what my lord was getting at because he seizes resisting he suddenly comes out we don't accept that it's important to note there's only one officer pulling it's PC Shatford I'm not, uh, let me be, be clear, it's one officer pulling, PC Shatford. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, well, it is the case, you can see it in the post-mortem report, Mr. Goodenough weighs 69 kilograms. Let's assume he goes limp, as PC Shatford says in his, in his police notebook, after the punches from Shane. For added significance, PC Shatford says, I'm not pulling with my whole weight, I'm just using my arms, tugging him. How does Mr. Goodenough fly out of the car and land face down where he did, causing the injuries that occurred? length of time, the fact that it's one sequence is, doesn't assist in answering that question. We say. And as I'll come on to develop, the judge hasn't really addressed that question. So, I said for the 
the purposes of this ground of appeal, this is the proportionality appeal, that we're going to be focusing on the punches and the extraction. I make it clear also that I'll be focusing on the latter of those, it's the extraction rather than the punches. Although it is correct to say that it is a sequence of events, in other words, there's no dividing line between each of the, in, the uses of force, it is, of course, to remember, without, depart, without wanting to kind of retread on ground two of the appeal, that the justification for each use of force is different. Does that matter on this question? On no. Question of proportionality? Uh, uh, sorry, I say no, but I'm a bit too quick to mark that. It, it does. What is proportionate has to be assessed by reference to the risk. Yes, but, but for both for both officers, what they're trying to do is get him out of the car. And one of them is trying to get him out of the car because he thinks he's going for a weapon, and one of them is trying to get him out of the car because he thinks he might drive the car forward on their account. For both of them, what they're trying to do is get him out of the car. And, and, and isn't that what has to be assessed, whether that's a proportionate reaction? No, the, 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 it's, it's not the intention that has to be assessed, what they're trying to do. It has to be the, the actual force they use. Yes, what, what they can't do. can't be measured to an... It's what they do, not what they're intending to do, what they actually do. Of course, recognising, again, heat of the moment, it's difficult to measure the proportionality of one's response down to finite fractions and all of the rest of those, uh, of those warnings. But it isn't about their intention, it's about the actual force used. It is the actual force used that has to be justified, not something else. Well, I, under, I understand that. My point was that the, the reason both of them are using force is, is to get him out of the car. And, and doesn't that mean that what's proportionate is... It, it doesn't really matter why they're... Um, what they think the threat is, which, as you explained, is a different threat in each case. But, but whether what they did was a proportionate reaction to what they would try, what they perceived the threat to be, and were trying to, to do to neutralise the threat. I, I accept that if one reduces what they were doing to, to simply trying to get them out of the car, then that's, albeit for different underlying reasons, then. There's no distinction of significance between them for the purpose of proportionality. But, I'm, but I must emphasize, that isn't the actual question. It's, whether, it's not why were they trying to remove him from the car, or even why were they trying to use the force. It's what force did they use, and was it proportionate? Yeah. Reducing this case to asking the question, was it reasonable to pull somebody out of the car? is, in, in my submission, to seriously distort that the questions that the judge was bound to answer, which we say didn't, in fact, answer. Was it reasonable to use the force they did to pull him out of the car? Or how would you... Question, what is the correct question? Well, well, I say that the, was it reasonable to use the force they did to pull him use, use it out of the, the car? The way that we did... Um, was it reasonable for... I have to look at them ind individually. I perhaps I'll focus on Shatford because he's the one who pulls him out of the car. Was it reasonable uh, for PC Shatford to use the force that he did in the light of the risk that he perceived? I think the way that I put this So that, forgive me, it's, it's, it's possible to overcomplicate it. Necessarily, by the time you've got to this stage, the judge will have, or ought to have, identified what was in the officer's mind and assessed whether or not it was reasonable. We only get to this stage once those two building blocks have been established. Once you've got to that stage through a logical sequence, it's easy just to ask the question, was the use of force reasonable in all of the circumstances? 
So to get to this question at all, the judge has got to have properly decided that the officer was pulling Mr. Good enough because he feared that if he didn't, he would drive the car in a way that would risk the life of other police officers. If the judge, you say the judge would be quite wrong to get to that position, I follow that, but if, if the judge does get to that position, how could the force used by Mr. Shatford not be proportionate to that very grave risk? Forgive me. I think my lord has confused the two officers here. I mean the one who was doing the pulling. He doesn't do so on the basis of the, of the fear of driving off. No, you're quite right. You're quite right. But he's trying, as my lord says, he's trying to get him out of the car. Yeah. For he's, what the judge the, has decided is a good guy. reason. Yes, exactly. But I don't think, for the purposes of my proposition, it may not matter that I've confused their purposes. No. Because actually what I'm asking you is whichever purpose it was, actually, whether he thought he was going for a lethal weapon or he was going to use the car as a lethal weapon, he was trying to get him out of the car. But with, with, well, how could the force that he was using, which is pulling on one arm, not be proportionate to that level of risk? Well, you, you, that, that um, with respect, assumes too much, which is that he was just pulling on one arm. Right. We, so, but, but we, it, so as part of this exercise, the judge has to deal with the actual force, to use, force used, and in the particular circumstances of this case, has to make findings of fact about how it is that Mr. Goodenough emerges from the car and suffers the injuries that he does. Well, he deals um, at 55, um, paragraph 55, do not accept any of the officers involved trespass beyond the bounds of exerting such forces as reasonable. For whatever reason, Mr. Goodenough was persistently resisting the officers, and when his resistance ceased, it is unsurprising, there must be a word missing, that he emerged yeah, from the car and landed with some force on the road surface. In other words, comes back to the point my lord made earlier, which is somebody's holding on tight. Well, this is what the judge says, in effect. Somebody's holding on tight and you're tugging and then they let go. It's, it's not going to be a, a graceful exit from the car. But the question isn't with respect to whether it's a graceful exit. The question is, how does he end up so far away from the car? This is without any analysis that I put before this court orally. Of the, of the shifting, I mean more than shifting, serious divergences in the way that the officers account for this. It, it, he ends up a body length away from the car, face down, and you, you've heard described the injuries that he suffered. Now I understand if the, officers are, if the officer, PC Shatford, is trying to get him out of the car, it's not likely to be uh, graceful, and if he's doing so, uh, if he's previously resisting, there may be a certain amount of energy transfer. I, I accept all of that. But you can't actually get away from the fact that on PC Shatford's account, and this isn't contradicted, let me make this clear, upon the second punch from PC Shane, Mr. Goodenough goes limp. PC Shatford at that stage is sort of crouching down, this is on his account, tugging, just using his arm weight against, PC, against Mr. Goodenough. Now, even being 69 kilograms, which is you know, a fairly slight individual, that doesn't explain how one officer, under the force of one officer, Mr. Goodenough can end up where he does. And this is where it's so important for the, for the, for the court at first instance, and this court, to look at the mechanics of how he emerges. So in other words, in order to succeed on your ground three, you've got to establish that the judge ought to have found that Shatford's evidence about the level of force he used was wrong and that a greater level of force must have been used than any of the officers was prepared to admit. No, I don't accept that. In order to succeed on ground three, I simply have to persuade this court, in my submission, that the judge has not engaged with the mechanics of the extraction. It's not a question of him having accepted the, the, the account of the force used by P.C. Shatford. P.C. Shatford effectively doesn't really explain it. He's at a loss to explain. I'll come back to this after the short adjournment. He's at a loss to explain the extraction. And I, I'm afraid at the risk of um, aggravating the court, I, I will also 
which is a risk I'm afraid I'm going to have to take. I will have to take you through the evolution of the account simulation to this, because there's such a, a change in the, in the way that the accounts of the extraction occur. Um, but but can I just sum up the position in relation to this? Our essential proposition is that the judge just doesn't deal with it. He avoids dealing with it. You've got it at paragraph 55, the sum total. It's not, it is unsurprising that he emerged from the car and landed with some force on the road. Well, it, especially in the context of the arguments that we were advancing, both as to the evolution of the account, but more importantly, the physics of this. How, how does he just emerge? And suffer the injuries that he does. The judge sh should have made findings in relation to this, and he hasn't done so. In fact, what he has done, we submit, is he has avoided engaging with the mechanics of the extraction. The the um, at the trial, the criminal trial, one of the independent witnesses, a fellow called Thomas Sayers. I'll, I'll, I'll just deal with this point, and then uh, perhaps that would be a convenient moment who was looking at what was happening from an upstairs window, said that Mr. Goodenough came out of the car like a cork from a bottle. And ultimately, that was an analogy that was accepted by PC Shatford. That rather simplifies PC Shatford's account. Right, well, we're now at um, one o'clock. How are, how are you doing on the time? Uh, I'm, I'm doing fine, I think. What, uh, have you discussed um, well, with Lord Fitz what the division of time is going uh, to be? I haven't. I'd anticipated finishing uh, no later than 3 p.m. And I will finish no later than 3 p.m. And that will give uh, uh, at least a uh, similar same amount of time to Lord Folk. Thank you very much. We'll sit again at uh, 2 o'clock.